Uh, my first question is that, uh, starting with uh, Frat House, or even maybe a little before that, but you you specialize in ensemble comedies, uh, focusing on uh, alpha male types, type characters, and I was wondering why you think you're drawn to this specific uh, male dynamic. <laughs> Probably because I grew up with all women in my household, not to <laughs> overanalyze it, but I didn't have a dad growing up, and uh, I always found it interesting why, why men you know, heterosexual men hang out with each other and have these kind of bonds. And a lot of my films have kind of um, been an investigation in, into that in a weird way. And I, something about that's always been really funny to me. There's an awkwardness to how uh, men, heterosexual men, relate to one another. There's always this sort of uncomfortable undertone to it. And that always makes for comedy in my mind. I don't know why. Right, right. And in, in, in this particular film, you know, it, it almost seems inevitable that, you know, you know, since this is a, you deal in this type of kind of male ensemble that, you know, sooner or later you're going to do a film where Vegas was kind of a backdrop. And, <laughs> right. And I was wondering, uh, what, did, what did you see in, in this material that kind of differentiated from all the other kind of Vegas-centric kind of comedies we've gotten over the last decade or so? Yeah, well, for me, it was the, the, the way the story was told. I like the, I like, uh, what intrigued me about this was making a movie about an event where you never see the event. You know, in this case, the event being a bachelor party in Vegas, but it could have been anything. And, and the idea of like, um, and then how Vegas ties into that, quite honestly, is just Vegas is a place where bad decisions are made every minute, uh, by everybody. <laughs> and it just felt again like kind of a, a ripe ground, a stage and set of comedy in. Um, but the challenge of it was, was exactly that, was making a movie where you don't actually see the thing that happened and instead you're living in the aftermath of these uh, bad decisions. Right. And was that always from, from draft one, was that always going to be the, the structure of it? That was. That was always in the original structure, yeah. And was there ever a, a, a moment where the, you know, maybe some executives or someone said, you know, maybe we could do a couple of flashbacks or did you... No, it wasn't... No, it wasn't like that. Um, it was very much about, you know, in a weird way, the movie's more like a detective story than anything. Mm -hmm. And there are little clues that, you know, come they come across these little clues as the movie goes on, and those little clues lead them to piecing together what happened. And, and in some ways, it's like a very, um, uh, it's like memento for dumb guys. <laughs> well, i I got to ask about this, the ensemble, in that, uh, and particularly uh, Zach and... Uh, and uh, and Ken and Ken Young, who who comes kind of a uh, a secondary character who comes into the foreground and kind of steals the film. And uh, I was wondering how did what how, what was the process of getting this ensemble together, and how did you know that these particular actors were going to click? You know, you never know, but you definitely you know. To me, it's 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 the biggest part of directing a movie is is, is you know when they work, they work because of the chemistry with the actors, whether it was road trip or old school. or Starsky, honestly, when my movies work, it's because of the great chemistry between the actors. And um, I just sort of, Zach was my first sort of uh, piece of the puzzle. I, I'd known Zach for years just through watching him do his stand-up. And uh, it's not even stand-up, it's more like performance art. And um, I always wanted to find a role for him. And, and the character of Alan that he plays is uniquely left-footed and really fits Zach in a way. And as far as Ken Jeong, I agree with you, he does steal a lot of the movie. He's so funny. And so out of nowhere, quite literally in the movie, that, um, you know, Ken is somebody I've been developing this other movie with. Obviously, he's had some roles in other films, and he's been great in those. So I knew him through those movies, and we've been developing this little project together for a little while. And we became friends, and I just wanted to put him in this movie. And uh, I'll ask the, uh, I'm sure you, everyone can ask this, I'm sure they've asked you already. What, what was the process of getting... Uh, Mike Tyson, and what were you know those days working with him like? Well, the process of getting him was not as hard as I thought it would be. You know, you, you immediately think it's going to be a tough guy to get to, and maybe he won't get the joke. Um, we sent the script to his manager, and then his man, and then Mike called me. Uh, his manager called me first, and Mike called me, and um, we talked about. Uh, uh, he loved it, and and the weirdest part is Mike is the hugest old school fan ever. He quotes old school more than like. 15 year old kids that come up to me in an airport <laughs> he knows old school backwards and forwards and uh so he got it and he got that the joke wasn't on him but instead the joke was on people's perception of mike and um to have him on set you know i was a little nervous he's not an actor he's a boxer but 
he came ready to play, and he really uh, was into fucking around in a, in, a, in a good way, how you want to fuck around on a comedy set. Right. And so was the Phil Collins sing-along, was that from script, or was that something that... No, that wasn't in the script either. That was something I thought of to do after we shot our first day with Mike. I realized, boy, man, he's pretty good. We should um, give him something a little more active to do and, and a little bit something more non-Mike Tyson to do. You know, and you just wouldn't picture him singing Phil Collins, so it just seemed yeah. funny to me. And, uh, and uh, I think it's going to be a reminder a lot of audiences how charming and really fetching she is, and that's Heather Graham, who hasn't been in a film that's been on that's going to be on 2,000 screens in a while. So I was wondering, you know, uh, how did that come about? Because uh, she's really she she provides kind of a a calm and sweetness. Uh, I know, and just like sunshine. She, she. When I look at Heather, I just see sunshine. There's something so sunny about her and her disposition. And, you know, listen, I've been in love with Heather since License to Drive. <laughs> right, right. You know, she's just the sexiest thing. And it's it's as if she doesn't age. I don't understand. She just always looks so beautiful. I mean, Boogie Nights was 10 years ago, and she pretty much looks the same in person. Um, so we basically offered the part to Heather, and um, she was into it. And I was so happy to get her. And... Yeah, she hasn't been in a ton of stuff, but things that she does do, uh, I think she's always great in, and I think she brings, a, like I said, a lightness to it that, that really helps. Because the movie, in some respects, is funny, of course, but or hopefully, but <laughs> has a has a darkness under it, you know, that I think is really cool, and I think Heather comes in and, and adds a, a certain amount of levity to it. In terms of the, the genre that you're, you're most recognized for, uh, the kind of... Uh, outrageous uh, comedic films it, it there seems to be a popular trend now to out raunchy the previous uh genre film and i was wondering do you feel that pressure because what what it strikes me about your film and reading about it is all the critics talk about the heart that this film has as well uh well you know and they did the same thing with with old school and quite honestly they did it with road trip and i think Whenever these movies work, I, you know, it, it always gives me the chills, but I understand it when people talk about raunchy or gross out because I never see the movies like that. I see them as real and feeling or, or grounded in some sort of reality and, you know, uh, to try to come across how friends really treat each other. You know, I have this joke where it's like, you're never nice to your friends. You're nice to people you don't like. Your friends, you can go, hey, man, mm -hmm. fuck, you know, it's like you treat them in a certain way because underneath it there's a love, and I think... You know, even, you know, what Judd Apatow does so well is there's heart in those movies. And it's not just because he's, he's Judd Apatow that the movies work. The movies work because he understands that to get away with all that stuff, there needs to be a real love underneath it, um, yeah. whether it's in Super Bad between Michael and uh, Jonah Hill's character or in, in this movie. And I think that's when these movies work, that's why they work. And when they don't work, they come off as kind of mean-spirited and not believable. Right, exactly. And 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 how do you know when it's working, when you're on set, particularly with a comedy? I would think it would be tricky, uh, with multiple takes and 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 perhaps to gauge I mean, what's honestly, working and what's not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's really the whole job of a director, and that's 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 you know a lot of people don't even know what directors do in a comedy. They think you just point the camera at funny people and they just be funny. But mm. really, what a director is is he's a purveyor of tone, and he and he just makes sure all the comedy that you're doing lives within the tone of the movie that you want to make or that you're setting out to make. So for me, it's just always managing the tone. So even when guys like Zach or Will Ferrell in the case of old school or whatever movie, when they go off script and they improvise, and I love improv improvisation, believe me, we always make sure that it's within the world of the character and the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, and with the test screening process, uh, I know you've had test screenings with this film and, and I'm wondering what you gain from that, because, again, with the comedy genre, I would think that that process would be uh, particularly valuable. The, 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 te the testing in a comedy is as important as the casting and the shooting and the editing. I mean, it really is another step. And uh, no matter how big and powerful a comedy director can become, they'll always test their movies, I think. I mean, I would never have the confidence to go, no, this is funny, let's just put it out there. Because you learn so much just in rhythm and pacing uh, by showing it to an audience. And um, it, it's, it's the most enlightening and the most stressful time of making the film, believe it or not. It really is. But stuff 
works that you don't think is going to work and stuff doesn't work that you thought was going to kill. And more importantly than even specific jokes, it just enables you to really hone in on the rhythm and the, the beats of a movie. And I think part of the thing why Hangover works is it's really tight. And it, yeah. it, it has that tightness because of, you know, test screenings and constantly sculpting it. Well, and it's got just a fantastic reaction, and there's a lot of buzz uh, around the film. And uh, I'm wondering if that puts extra pressure on you if you're feeling that. No, no, I love it. You know, honestly, I think any filmmaker loves a buzz around their film. Anything to kind of separate out of all the white noise in summer movies that summer movies can make. In a weird way, I, I think the when there's buzz surrounding a film, the only pressure that the only people that feel the pressure are the people uh, marketing and selling the movie, the, the studio. Right, right. And I like that pressure for them because they know they know the movie works. Now they got to figure out to sell it the right way. And I think they've been doing a stupendous job, by the way. But but I think that's the people that ultimately feel the pressure because so often in the movie business, you know, you're um, <laughs> You're, there's a little deception involved sometimes in selling a movie. It's not always what you're selling. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but with this film, I really feel like we're selling the movie. And, and the, the funny part is the, the, somebody at Warner's, one of the studio guys said to me, the best ad for this movie is the movie. There's no trailer we can cut that is going to be better than how the movie plays with an audience. So we've done 300, literally 300 screenings around the country just mm. showing it to people so they can go out and tell their friend. You know, it's like that word of mouth thing. When you have a movie that plays well, you just want to put it out there as much as possible. Yeah, and that word of mouth, man, it's going around. It's 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 getting pretty loud. So I, I wish know, the... I know. I almost feel like God. I wish the movie would come out already before the backlash starts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, I'm going to turn you over to Jerry uh, for the close of the interview. Thank you, Todd. It's Jerry. It's um, very nice to meet you. You too. Very nice. Um, yeah, I'm the black sheep in the movie Keeps United Family. Um, I have to tell you, you've done you don't you like know. it. You know, like <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no. Um, in 2003, February 2003, I saw Old School, the packed uh, sneak preview in Los Angeles. And it was probably the first time since the early 80s I've been in the movie theater. I go to, I go to see the movies like 400 times a year. First wow. Time the early 80s where the whole audience was just could not stop laughing. And it really had become apparent uh, even more so than um, Judd Apatow, that you were really the heir to subversive humor, the great subversive comedies of Harold Ramis, Ivan Reitman, all those guys, the great, the, the truly great comedies of my childhood. And I just want to know what kind of influence did they have on you growing up? I mean, obviously, well, it, I would say the impact but, is enormous. Yeah, I mean, I, I jokingly say, I've said this before, I, I say I, I like to pretend like I grew up watching Preston Sturges and Billy Wilder, but the truth is, I grew up on Stripes and The Jerk and Blues Brothers and, yeah, John Landis, Ivan Reitman, Harold Ramis. Mm -hmm. Those were the guys. I mean, I don't know how old you are, but those were the guys that I also went to the movies every weekend as a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old, and those were the movies I would see. And I love those man-on-a-mission or men-on-a-mission comedies yeah. and the, the, the slobs versus the snobs mentality. Of course. Yeah, and, no, and that's and it's just uh, that a, those are huge, huge influences. I mean, I think I think The Jerk and, and Blues Brothers and Stripes were probably my three most seminal films. But yeah, oh, without a doubt. No, my mom, my mom took us to see Animal House on opening day, and I think I was um, I was six years old, and the ticket, the woman at the ticket office said, "Aren't you afraid this woman, this uh, film will damage your, your son?" And my mom was like, "That's none of your fucking business." <laughs> <laughs> mom is cool. <laughs> yeah. No, so my, my thing is, though, going now, deal with Animal House, you made probably the first film since Animal House that really went into, like, the fraternity or at least the, you know, the guy, a guy, let's say a men's, all right, let's say a men's health lifestyle. Yeah. The mag, let's use men's health as the be-all, um, end-all of the guy's lifestyle and did it well, and you, didn't, and you didn't feel the need to imitate it. You created your whole new iconography of dialogue and yeah. uh, architecture. But my thing is, going back to your, the documentary, Frat House, I'm curious you know, Sprat was a very serious film, but you managed to take a lot of the, I guess you would say, the comedic elements of, of a fraternity life, and they, they obviously play in Road Trip, Old School, and it looks like in The Hangover. What, what, what is it about the fraternity life that appeals to you? Well, you know what it is? It's back to what I was saying earlier, which is like I grew up with, with three women, and, and my mom always um, told us, to be unique and to stand out and to never mm -hmm. be part of a group, to be honest with you. And I've been fascinated 
with guys that feel this need to be part of a group. I never mm-hmm. understood it. And so it's funny because people that don't know me think, oh, he must be like a fraternity guy. It must be like the kind of thing he's like that guy. And it's so not who I am. It's actually I'm just right. fascinated with the man and their need to belong to a group, to not be right. identified to not be identified on their own, but to instead be labeled by a group, even back to fucking Little League, you know? It's like I never yeah. understood that sort of mentality. So so for me, it is very much uh, exploration of that. I just found that I found that just unbelievable to me. Okay, you know? cool. My other, my other question, though, is how do you do it? How do you know with some of these actors, you've given them, like, career-making performances or career-reviving performances? You were the, really the first director to really take advantage of Vince Vaughn's comedic talents and swingers with old yeah. school. Or you're the first director um, to get Will Ferrell, everything that we, he showed us in Saturday Night Live, to bring that out on the big screen, and especially in Road Trip with DJ Qualls. I don't think he was ever better than he was in Road Trip. Uh, Tom Green, that's you know, he was very good right. there. And Meyer, especially. And Snoop Dogg in Starsky and Hutt. I mean, <laughs> let's not, you know, everyone makes fun of that, but let's be very honest. He's hysterical in that movie. But like, yeah. How do you know? How do you how do you get this out of them? You get, everyone like shows up and gives them this, their best work for you. Yeah, I don't, I really appreciate you saying that, and and I do think with with Zach, it's going to be the same feeling. People are going to go, where the hell did this guy come from? He's been around forever, and he's even been in movies, but he's never really been used correctly. And I I just think. For me, it's like I hone in on what attracts me to them in the first place, into their comedy in the first place, and I really, maybe it's because I'm also a writer, but I build the part for them. I literally, jokingly, I say it's like the Franklin Mint where we handcrafted for this person. So we created this brother-in-law character in Hangover, in the Hangover for Zach because I know Zach is left-footed and I know Zach you know, pretends like he wants to belong but never does belong, and he's always just sort of on the fringe. So you kind of build the part a little bit more Mm -hmm. around the actor, and then you just let the actor come and do what they do so well, you know, and then and on top of that, you just keep going at it until they give it to you, honestly. And, um, you know, actors, actors want direction and actors want to do great. I mean, you know, they like that more than anything, and I think, um, you know, it's just it's, it's a process, um, but uh, it's it's my favorite part of the whole thing, honestly. It's like, and it's also my proudest thing is like hearing that, like, oh yeah, you took Vince and you put him in a big thing and you made people realize this guy's fucking hysterical because Vince is one of the funniest people in the world, and um, and yeah, so that 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 is a that is what attracts me to even scripts or ideas is like, boy, this will be really castable in a way. I could really crush this and bring some new faces into this and just show people, like, you know, just blow them away. I think Ed Helms, same thing in this movie. I think he's going to be, you know, people are just going to really, like, put him on their lists. And and it's it's just really satisfying to do that. Right. Does, does, does Zach have, like, the Frank the Tank persona in this film? Is that Does he, like, steal every scene he's in? Have you not seen the movie yet? No, no, I don't, I'm not sleeping with the right people. I didn't get to see the screening, so, you know, I'm sleeping with the wrong people. <laughs> honestly, I mean, I don't know, the, the, the guys you're with, I think, saw it. Or, honestly, I think, I think Zach, yeah, Zach is, if you want to call it that, he's the Frank the Tank of the film, and, and he comes up and he created a character, or we created a character together, the same way Will created Frank the Tank. Mm-hmm. Um, he inhabits this guy in such a unique way, and again, you know, a bachelor party movie in Vegas doesn't sound unique at all, but the fun thing about The Hangover is it's not what you think it is in, in, in a lot of levels, and I think even in the acting level of, of, of what Zach brings to it and Ed and Bradley, we just we just treat it a lot better than what you, you think it would be treated as. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it sounds like you made the Reservoir Dog uh, film of um, of bachelor party movies in Vegas. I mean, the bachelor party's never. It's like the heist. It's never meant. It's never shown in a film. So I mean, you already got you got it over everyone else who's made a bachelor party film. Um, I think but, I think this is the last word on bachelor parties for a long I think time. It sounds a bit. My last question: Is there anything you can share with us about old school dose? Um, I could share everything with you. I mean, really, it's like you know, Scott Armstrong and I was my writing partner. We wrote a, we wrote a, I think a fantastic script for Old School Dose, and um, we got it to the guys. And quite frankly, it's a little bit of a victim of, and this is going to be boring, but it's a little bit of a victim 
of uh, corporate <laughs> moves. In other words, DreamWorks got sold to Paramount, and then DreamWorks left and went to Disney. The old school was a DreamWorks movie, went to Paramount, and then got stuck at Paramount because DreamWorks couldn't take it with them to Disney. And the executives that the executives of Paramount just don't. It's not in their interest necessarily to, to put that film on top and to make all the planets align that have to align to get Vince Vaughn and Will Ferrell and their schedules all mm-hmm. synced up to do this movie. Now, that said, if Vince and Will were both dying to do the movie, we'd be able to put that together. So, right. in fairness, you know, it's been hard to engage with Vince on this. He's doing his own thing right now, which I like, and I like the things he's been doing. So, quite honestly, I'm not sure that we're going to see that anytime soon. And if we don't see it soon, we might never see it. But uh, I love those guys and I hope to do other stuff with them. But maybe Old School 2 is maybe Old School two is not in the cards. Okay. Mm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Old cool, guys. Todd, Todd Van, thank you so much, man. We wish you the best of luck with the movie. And uh, you're great. Come back anytime. Yeah, thank that was you. The, yeah, you're the best. A, <laughs> thank you. That was a great interview, guys. I really appreciate it.